So I think everybody's here. Uh, uh, everybody's yep. here. Good, great, awesome. We're all <laughs> in the same in the same page in the same window. So thank you for for giving us the time to talk about um finding her beat. I gotta thank say, you. um, I I finished watching it yesterday. Uh, and I felt happy. I felt um intrigued on what Tycho is. I felt how empowering each story and what this film is meant to to be for for all types of viewers, but especially um females and women out there in the world. And it, it's a film that I hope that can touch everybody's hearts and they can move forward in you know gaining uh whatever ground they want to do or whatever success they want to do in the future because this film is is that it's that powerful so oh, thank you. yay thank you <laughs> so i i do want to ask uh first i'm gonna have this question for dawn and from there we can go ahead and um go with the other questions in, in a circle because I would like to get everybody's points of view because again this this film uh touches so much culture and so much personal lives that that I was like there was moments in the film that I just started crying because it's mm -hmm. it, it's it's very heartwarming and it's very touching in each one of these players um life stories so Don, my question would be, what inspired you to bring this story to the world? Well, um, the it, Jennifer Weir <laughs> inspired me <laughs> to bring this story to the world. Uh, and Jen, uh, Jen and I have been friends for quite a long time, and we were having lunch, and she asked me. Uh, well, she was saying that she was going to do this amazing concert in two years. This was in twenty eighteen. And she's going to bring in all these amazing women, and you know, could could I work to document the concert, um, you know, just the concert um, for you know, kind of historic? We knew it was going to be a historic concert, and I said, you know, Jen, this this is more than that. This this is a film, and we're in a position where we're two years out, so we could really show how this developed, how it evolved, how those two weeks of these women being together in one place for the first time, how that plays out. I, there's so much more going on here. And Jen fully agreed, which was great. Uh, it was the easiest pitch ever. <laughs> <laughs> and and then I, I talked with my friend Carrie and Carrie and I have known each other, Carrie Pickett and I have known each other for a shorter amount of time, um, but we were in the film Fatales, which is a, a group of women directors it's a national organization um and uh pitched it to her and asked her if she wanted to join me in this journey and, and she said yes so how so. about you carrie uh how about you because i know that you're part of like the directors here so how about yourself how I, did how did it inspire you you know what's your story behind when jennifer presented you the project well, I think um, over my many decades of work of focusing on family and community and how much one person can make a difference and people struggling to right a wrong, uh, in like all, so many of those circles, there's a drum. And the drum is really central and key in so many circles in the Native American community where I do a lot of work in the radical fairy community where I did a book and um, personally identify as a radical fairy. And um, in so many circles, there's a drum. And so I would say it's the uh, drum and the women's centric aspect of this entire project because not only were there women in front of the camera, but um, for me as the DP, the two um, second DP, the, the second people for who were helping me were women. And so it was almost everybody on the um, production side, either Asian, queer, non-binary women, and um, really from a very marginal, you know, usually from a marginalized place. So for me, it hit on all my buttons. Okay. So the thing is that 
this documentary, the main focus of it is female empowerment and showing the world the art of taiko. And as well, showing the world how this um culture is was or is or was back um thanks to you to everybody that wants to move uh to make a change was a male dominant um area so this is a question for everybody uh, because I, I again like i mentioned i only thought that i was going to get the directors but having <laughs> megan and jennifer here it, it brings me excitement inside how does it feel that Give me one second because I, I had the question in my mind and it went and went bye bye. <laughs> How do you guys all feel of being part of this amazing project? And Jennifer then seeing um Jennifer Macon seeing the final product, not only in finding her beat, but as well in the concert. How do you guys all feel about being part of this major project? Well, I would say it's just been an incredible gift and an incredible, you know, roller coaster ride because you know, whenever you take on something that's big, you have no idea where you're gonna come out on the other side, if, if you're gonna come out on the other <laughs> side. And so you kind of just put your faith and all your energy forward towards these big ideas and hope that it will manifest. And fortunately it, it did in, and is even better than how I would have dreamed. Um, all the things that Don and Carrie brought in terms of their eye and storytelling and the details that they wove together um, really helped elevate our story and share it beyond, you know, just that concert hall. Um, so it's just been a wonderful collaboration on every level, you know, behind the camera, in front of the camera, during shooting, after shooting. Um, it's been such a gift and I've learned and grown so much. And, you know, even just seeing the film and seeing this little snapshot, you know, pre-pandemic um, of our family when our daughter was a certain age is, it's, it's it's a wonderful gift to have that captured in such a beautiful way. Um, so, yeah, uh, and sometimes, you know, stories or moments have kind of an energy of their own where you're like, everyone's ready for this kind of project and this kind of story. In fact, they're kind of hungry for it. And so you find that you get a lot of yeses and things fall together in a certain way and and it sort of has a life of its own. And I felt very much like that on this on this ride. How about you, Megan? I would say it's really fun and exciting to be the change. Um, I I was there, my feet were on the ground when, along with many of these women for the last 30 years, as we've been on the sidelines, like building groups, doing all the work, um, but never getting to be on stage. Um, still teaching, still learning, just never getting on stage. And then uh, many times asking um, the established community for, gigs or spots or spotlights or to be part of the narrative and never uh, making it into those narratives. Um, so it's amazing um, to stand up and come out and be here for the next generation of Tycho players and say, this is, these are also masters. You haven't met these people yet. You, you haven't really seen these people. And here we are all together because we put together the stage for ourselves and there used to not be a seat at the table, but we've brought our own chairs. And I would encourage the next generation to do that too. Don't wait, just get up there, do your hard work. And um, it's a beautiful thing to be part of a collective that then there's just art pouring out, pouring out generations and cultures, just it all comes out on the stage. And so it's phenomenal that Don Mickelson and Carrie Pickett caught it. <laughs> through the camera lenses. And now it didn't just happen one night. Now it can be seen and known and heard in the narrative from ever, forever on. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. I wanna throw out there what, what Megan just made me think of with this idea of claiming the stage and also claiming the narrative that this is, what's exciting to me about this is that they laid this amazing foundation and, you know, took their place on stage and said, you know, if you're not going to invite us, we're going to bring our own chair. We're going to throw our own party. We're going to do it ourselves. And then the film echoes that with, and we're going to tell the dang story. And <laughs> we're not going to leave it to anybody else to tell this story. We will tell this story. And that changes how the history is, is conveyed. It's, it's no longer, I think Jen has talked about this, that it's, it's, um, 
we can't undo this. This is now history. And the film kind of it leaves it there for the world to see that that this happened. And I think that that is critical. And I I feel like I've learned so much about claiming my voice and what I should be doing and when I should be giving myself permission to do it regardless of whether somebody grants that permission to say, well, I'm just going to do the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's amazing. Amazing. So Carrie, do you have anything to add to, to everybody's statements? You know, I, I'm just so inspired by everybody. You know, it's uh, just shocking for me how much can be done. Um, we're calling ourselves the dream team. And I've never experienced anything like this before. I've always been kind of a solo person out there producing and directing and filming my own films. And now I see, gosh, if, you know, I'd like had a better team or any team at all, you know, I could have maybe done a lot better because everybody's just top of their game, you know, not only on the drum, but just like at every step of the way. And so I'm just humbled and honored to be a part of the whole thing, really. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Uh, I can imagine that when I finished the film, I do, did see that um, Japan uh, on 2021 did her, their own um, her beat concert and seeing that that happened I'm like I hope that this continues you know moving forward right there's something that it's really um very very highlighted in the documentary and I I caught it very late I think it was mid in the documentaries when I caught it when I started seeing the dates um, because every time the date, you guys, um, every day when the concert was coming in, uh, there was like a countdown. But when I noticed on the dates was that it was almost when the, well, not almost, it was during and then while the pandemic happened. So were there any challenges, Don, Carrie, and Megan and Jennifer? Because I know that we have the directors and then we have Megan and Jennifer that are the ones that worked on, on the stage and everything. Were there any challenges? I know that in the film, we can see some of the certain challenges, but I would like to get your story behind these challenges that happened when the pandemic was announced or when it was starting. Jen? I would say it was very much you know, uh, like most people's experience where you you knew you had the sort of inklings of this big thing going on, but we were so, you know, in rehearsals 12 hours a day, um, not watching the news, kind of in our own bubble, trying to, you know, will this big thing into happening that um, it wasn't front of mind. And it wasn't almost until after everything hit and you realize, oh my gosh, we were just walking that razor's edge. We were so close. All these things were just kind of looming and we had no idea. Or if we did, it was just kind of this twinkling of an idea. Um, it was, it, you know, looking back, it, it seems like such a huge miracle. Um, and I think, you know, like everyone, we had no idea what was in store for us. Or even if we did, you know, maybe a couple weeks of impact, but after that, we'll be back on our feet. But <laughs> You know, it was it was incredible. And for me personally, it was such this huge, you know, huge marker of having maybe the one of the biggest sort of projects of my life happening and unfolding. And then the next moment, like go into complete, you know, nationwide shutdown. It was such a juxtaposition of, of extremes. Um, it was really a fascinating time. Mm -hmm. How about for for Don, Megan? Uh, the experience and carry? Um, well, I'll throw out there that, um, you know, the film, yeah, as Jen was talking about, it, we were shooting right up to the razor's edge of the pandemic, not recognizing how significant it was going to be in our lives, knowing something was on the horizon. Um, but then for post-production, um, 
we were in, you know, we were lucky. We were lucky to have wrapped production just before we couldn't shoot anymore. We were lucky to have had that final concert before all the venues were shut down. Um, and and we were lucky to, you know, in some ways, I think I, I feel lucky to have been able to have immersed myself in this world for months and months and months. So while the world was shut down, I was busy watching people make beautiful things and, you know, trying to figure out how to craft it and edit and carry it, it you know, was probably in a similar position, but I'll let her speak for herself. <laughs> there were four editors on this film. And, and so the time that I had to be able to really like focus on this beautiful place when the world outside was doing some crazy stuff was, was actually very, you know, like it was good for the heart. Um, I will say that post-production from a nuts and bolts perspective, we were going to be editing remotely anyway to an extent because Carrie and I live in different towns. And um, But we ended up doing stages of post-production remotely that we wouldn't have done, um, like color correction would have been, we would have been in studio with Oscar Aboza. Um, and as it was, Carrie and I were in a Zoom color correction room. You know, <laughs> so So things like that were different. Um, but yeah, I, the more I think about it, the more I was, I'm like, this film really was a gift for my mental health during a really rough time. Anybody else wants to add in? Uh, well, on the production side, I will say that, um, and just echo what Dawn said that un under any other circumstances, if life would have been in its normal rhythm, I don't, I think the, the post-production would have taken us longer because we just really were able to do that deep dive on in with a lot of, a lot of footage. And, you know, with the documentary, there's um, just so many ways it can, it can go. And um, so that edit is just so important and I, I'm grateful. I can't imagine uh, how long it would have taken if actually the world hadn't shut down and given us that amazing shelter with which to focus on what all these women did and um, to really be able to give it the time that it deserves. Um, I I will share an interesting kind of slice. Um, as an artist, being in the project was utterly exhausting, um, trying to make sure these 18 women that we got along for two weeks and that the show came to be and um, through lots of challenges. And um, personally, I had quit Tycho and uh, came into the project having quit um, in order to have a child and also because I wanted to quit. Um, but by the end of the project, even um, at the end of the, the whole trajectory, I realized in my head very clearly, I said, if I could do this, uh, typo like this for the rest of my life, that's what I want to do. And then bam, COVID. Um, and the, the, the concert ended the 29th of fe February. I'm also a nurse and it was, I went right back to nursing. Um, and it was two weeks later that we began to be told that we had been exposed at work. Um, and then just weeks and weeks of, well, you have to use this mask or this mask or this is how you protect and this is the proper thing. Um, so we really were just right before um, it came to the US. I remember the Italian videos on, on social media saying, you guys are gonna go through this all around the world and just get used to sheltering in. And I was kind of like, yeah, well, they're waiting to see if it's actually gonna hit us. Mm -hmm. um, so it eventually did. And, and it's interesting because as an artist, I was, it was many things were catastrophic for me at the moment that that concert was over. Um, and it's so great to hear from Don and Carrie that it was good for Don's mental health through the pandemic. Cause I was convinced that that was it, that we got great footage and that was it. We would never raise the money we needed to, to do something with that footage. So I was convinced we did a good job. We, we did a good try, but um, here we are lights out black, for all performers and so it's super neat that you two kind of carried the torch <laughs> I knew that till now so one of the things that I that I was catching up on on the film is that there's a lot of memorable 
moments when you see the taiko players live you have moments in japan you have moments when they're on the rehearsals then you have the main event plus there's all there's other moments as well that you see like um the other taiko players like pra practicing on their side what was the how was it to film this main event because i remember in the film that when you guys were ready for the show they said that the venue was it's big enough but due to the to the boxes there was not that much space so my question would be for for don and carrie how was it filming the live event due to the fact of the limited space well i think that was more of a, a limitation for the performers and the people on stage okay for us Uh, I think we could have used, we had five cameras on the final night performance, on the leap year performance. I think it would have been great if we had had another one. One more, you know, would have been just perfect. Uh, so it was something, again, that uh, was just epic on all levels that we were able to have that kind of coverage and still needed, had so much going on that we needed more. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I, I can imagine now because myself as 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 a content creator, I sometimes like when when I do interviews, um, in-person interviews, I, I tell my my best friend that he's the one that always like helps me out. I'm like, I think we need another, like another camera. He's like, <laughs> we don't have it. I'm like, oh, I wanted the other camera, but it's, it happens, right? <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> It, this is a question for 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 everybody. I, I imagine that obviously this is this is an amazing project. This is an amazing uh story, but there had to be a favorite moment for each one of you while filming or while creating this project and making it happen to the main event. So can each one uh, tell us what is your favorite moment while filming or while creating finding her beat? You know, I'm going to throw out here. This it is not your question, so I, I apologize. But what It's keeps fine. coming to mind to me <laughs> is is uh, my favorite moment was recent, and it was sitting in the theater at Mill Valley at our world premiere, um, and having an audience that was cheering during during performances, like in the middle wow. of the film. <laughs> and as somebody who's who's made documentaries for 20 years that's never happened before and so it was so neat to be in this theater where people were hooting and hollering while the film was playing and and part of that was because we had a large number of taiko players in that audience so they were seeing themselves they were seeing their experiences on on screen for the first time and so the the meaning of that was also not lost on me and i think that as a filmmaker when when the um when the you know participants in the film uh enjoyed the film feel represented feel like their voices were heard that to me is usually the most important part and the most powerful part of the whole process you know is is being like we did it <laughs> we did it <laughs> so, i'm sure there's a, a production story in there but that's what popped into my head when you asked I can imagine. Yes. <laughs> um, one of my favorite moments was actually in retrospect too, is, um, you know, after the pandemic hit and our daughter was, you know, home for school and everything was such a struggle, you know, for everyone, including myself. Um, and we were saying, yeah, 2020, that year sucked. You know, that was the worst year ever. And then she said, yeah, but there was her beat. And so it was great for her and for me to realize that for our daughter, that that was the highlight of what was a terrible year. And so, you know, as um, as a parent and as someone who juggles performance in the stage and your family and your daughter and wanting her to be a part of it, but also, you know, knowing that for her, it was such a positive experience and a highlight of her year. Um, was so rewarding and for me because I always feel that guilt of any time you know you leave for a rehearsal and um, 
you know, you feel like you're not there, but you're providing something else, you know, um, and that we were able to have her be as part of it as much as possible. Um, that to me was a, a real surprise gift, I guess, in all of this. I would say for me, it was um, being able to connect the performance aspect of Taiko to the spiritual aspect of Taiko in Japan. And to have the temple connection be there and be a part of the ritual of the performance and the meaning behind the action. So I thought for me, that was so beautiful to be able to be there and feel that. I would say um, that as a taiko player and as a female taiko player or non-binary actually, um, that taiko, the nature of taiko is you just exhaust yourself uh, for every show, for every event. And I was very exhausted um, as a taiko player when we began this film and I think the best moment for me is, um, first of all, seeing the international team of women, people of color, um, non-binary folks, like from Switzerland, from Australia, like talented people coming on board and making this thing happen. And really the most brilliant moment for me was when I realized all the years I'd spent in Japan, all these years that I had, you know, done the epic search to become the greatest, most beautiful performer good, um, we're not for nothing. That like this thing is taking off. It's so big and there's so many people and the timing's right. And um, my whole life was not for nothing. It's amazing. No, oh, I, I, I can imagine. One of my favorite moments is um, same as Carrie the aspect of how you combine uh, Taiko and culture and as well the spiritual side, um, seeing how they combine and they, it has such a big meaning uh, in, in every aspect of the way, how it, it affects you spiritually and in your day-to-day -day life as well. So I have a major question for each and one of you because it's not a question, it's just, I would like to see a statement from each and one of you because Don and Carrie as female directors, and then we have Jennifer and Megan as Tycho players, and as well Jennifer the coordinating the event. Do you guys want to send a message to for all women out there who would love to direct or be a Tycho player in the future, or have a big project that they are afraid to continuing? Do you have a message for for everybody out there? Um, to female empower them to move forward and make their goals. Dolores Huerte, si se puerte. Si, right? Just, you can. Yes, we can. And I would say, you know, whether it's Taiko or filmmaking, like this is not an uncommon experience for women and non binary to be in whatever field you're in, to have to to really have to break through, to have to be twice as good, to get half of the attention. Um, so I feel that I've been really inspired by people's response to the film who have never heard of Tycho before, who really can relate and see themselves in this film. And to you, I would say the um, the Korean, um, Korean uh, a phrase or um, uh, rallying cry of fighting just means <laughs> Go for it, fighting, keep trying, don't give up. <laughs> I would tell every uh, female, non-binary, marginalized, invisible artist out there that even though I think there's a, an essential part of being an artist that you do feel like you're alone or that it's uh, just about your um, creative endeavor, I would say work really hard, learn everything you can um, and trust your authentic and powerful story and abilities. Uh, but especially that you are not alone, that there is a collective of us. You can jump onto our loading dock, uh, onto the loading dock of this film and plug into us, um, but there's plenty more everywhere. You just gotta connect. And 
And I would jump off of that. And, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the message for for women and non-binary folks. Um, But I guess I also have been really moved by how men have championed this film. Um, and in unexpected ways. I mean, you know, it's it's one thing to you know be like, oh, that was nice. I liked it. Um, it's another <laughs> thing to open doors. And we've had a number of men in positions of power see this film, hear about this film, and open doors for this film and for its crew and for its message. And I think that um, there's just so much more that can be done in that way, and that. You know, often you hear men like, well, what can I do? And it's like, really listen, (laughs) (laughs) listen to the stories that are being told by women, listen to what they're asking for, maybe even look for what they're not asking for. I mean, I I don't know. I just, I feel like there's a message there for, for men as well. And that, that message is about opening doors. When you, when you are a gatekeeper, where, you know, who's in the room with you? And if there aren't women, if there aren't people of color, why? Why? Yeah, you know, uh, going going off to that, before before I got offered to cover find, Finding Her Beat, I already had watched the trailer before. And <laughs> I, I was like, I, I told, I was watching the trailer and my wife was next to me. And I told her, I want to cover this, but I don't know if, oh. if, if we're going to get it. And and then I went ahead and talked to my editor and he's like, well, let me see what I can do. When I met Annie in one of our previous interviews uh, and she sent us the email for finding her beat, I'm like, I told my editor, this is what I want to cover. I want to oh. cover it like no matter what I need to cover this. Um, I got to say, like, because the story is so empowering and in, and only bringing to the table that you can do anything that you put your your mind to and not only the fact that all of you are are setting a a i would say you are setting in stone a piece of history of bringing an event a story and a concert that i know that will continue going going to different places in the future of female taiko players making a change and opening doors so <clears throat> it, it's just empowering on how this film can can open gateways can open minds and can make sure that everybody out there especially females can thrive on any area and make it happen this this is why this film was so important to me I'm to crying. be able to cut co- to cover it. So, um, oh, my, you made Carrie cry. I'm, I'm crying. sorry. <laughs> That's what. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My final <laughs> my final question for each and one of you is: Do you guys have any upcoming projects? Are we seeing her beat? in any other um, theater. I hope that one day you guys come to Puerto Rico, just saying um, <laughs> that, that we can That'd be, be awesome. like, that Like that, me and my wife can be like right there with my son in oh. the front of the stage. Yeah. Um, so do you guys have any upcoming projects? The floor, the floor is for all of you. Like that you guys can tell us what's upcoming and or what are you guys working on? Well, I'll just put the dream out there that we do hope that from the energy of this film and um, the festivals uh, that we do pick up, you know, an enthusiastic producer who wants to bring bring all the drummers back together and do a world tour, do a um, do a leg on Broadway. I think that this is exactly what the world needs right now. So I'm going to keep holding out hope that that's what's next in store. Um, So, yeah, I would love to keep the Herbeat movement going. I'll say that we have lots of drums and I'm down for that. And um, I'm also writing a book about the whole uh, experience of being a taiko player. Um, Carrie, Don, any projects that you guys are working on? Don, do you wanna? <laughs> oh, okay, I'll go. <laughs> Let Carrie pull herself together. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I still, I wanna see this film get as far and, you know, as possible. I want it to 
get it in front of as many audiences as possible. So I'm putting a lot of my energy right now into finding distribution partners who are passionate about this story, not just like, oh, I did all the work, but like, I want to work with people who are like, this, this means something. People, people like you, frankly, who, who have, feel the story in them, in themselves. And we are starting to have those conversations. So that's exciting. And, you know, we're going to do it impact campaign um, for the film as well that we're pretty excited about. Um, so, you know, folks should follow us on social media um, that we'll be announcing all the things there. Um, but I will also say, you know, outside of finding her beat, I have another film called Minnesota Mean that is set to premiere in the next mm, few months, knock on all the wood, um, <laughs> that Ooh. is uh, a year in the life of the Minnesota Roller Derby um, in 2017. I was actually shot before this film. Uh, and, you know, so I've got two films that are about women claiming their space, physical space, the space of the between the ears and outside. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm excited to get that film out there. I'd love to see these two films at a festival together because I think that they're complementary in their own ways, so. That would be cool. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that would be really cool. Well, we're going um, to Austin, Texas uh, for the opening of Sound Unseen in Austin on November 3rd. And then that's uh, the Texas premiere. We're having our Minnesota premiere on November 11th uh, in and um, on 11 11. Well, <laughs> and then, you know, it gives us. Um, an affirmation of um, Kaoli's number 11 being a healing uh, force for the world and a healing force to actually create peace. And um, to echo what Dawn said, one of the people who stood up at Mill Valley uh, at the film festival happened to be an Oscar winning director himself. And he said that he thought the film could bring world peace. And we were like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. So, you know, we're hoping the film brings world peace. Yeah, <laughs> that that would be amazing. I got to say, yes. <laughs> and, then, and then outside of this um, amazing uh, Herbeat movement, which we see as the film being, you know, a lucky part of uh, uh, a part of a Herbeat movement, um, I'm uh, doing a film on indigenous women standing for the water against line three. And I'm in the uh, final state. I mean, I'm in the rough cut stage of that. It'll be called Ribbon Skirt Warriors. Oh, nice, nice. I'm so, so excited. I, ju I just do love hearing when when they're like, oh, I'm working on this film. And I'm like, in my, in my head, I'm like, okay, have to uh, be paying attention because I'm going to cover that as well. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But I want to thank each and one of you, Don, Megan, Carrie, and Jennifer, for, for giving us the time here to talk about Finding Her Beat here in the Nerdy Basement. And again, uh, I got to say that at first, I only thought that I was going to talk to Don and Carrie, but being able to get to talk to Jennifer and Megan is, for me, is super exciting because having the conversation on, on how this film came to to flourishing and how the event came to flourishing as well and seeing your stories as well it's just for me is uh i'm re inside i'm just withstanding my excitement uh <laughs> i'm being able to talk to to both of you and to don and to carrie so thank you very much for your time and for everybody that's watching us in the nerdy basement we'll see you in the next one yay thank you I'm so glad we're in a nerdy basement. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> yes.